First, let me apologize that I am slightly late for my own talk. And <laughs> secondly, thanks a lot to Shubra for uh, this invite. And I am learning a lot listening to uh, numerous wonderful talks that have happened thanks, so far. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm going to um, describe some uh, things we have found uh, working uh, with my graduate student, Aman Kumar, uh, who is in the audience. Uh, and um, uh, this is related to uh, what happens to Kitai quasi-particles in the presence of uh, perturbations. Uh, some of this work is also based on older work which uh, we have been doing for a number of years with these uh, collaborators. Um, we have benefited uh, greatly from discussions with Shaunak, Kedar's former student who is now in Oxford, Kedar himself, Penthil, Subro, Sampat Kumaran in TIFR, and Nandini. <clears throat> okay, so today I will uh, mostly focus on this uh, reference number one. And uh, briefly refer to wherever needed uh, our older papers which are useful for coming to some of these uh, standings in the latest. Okay, so uh, most of you are probably uh, more than familiar with the Kitai model, but I just want to quickly let it warm, warm you up. Uh, so what I have is a, a honeycomb lattice on which uh, at every vertex I put uh, spin half particles, and uh, I allow nearest neighbor interactions, which in each bond is of the Ising type. So let's say I have this site number one, and you have uh, three types of bonds going out, which I uh, respectively call X, Y, and Z. Um, <clears throat> so on the X bonds, I allow only the X components of these spins to interact via an Ising XX interaction. Similarly for Y and for Z. So this uh, seemingly innocuous uh, change from the usual uh, Ising model has enormous uh, effect on the physics of the model. <clears throat> so it turns out that this model is uh, integrable and its classical realizations have long been known as Google Komsky compass models. They arise in manganites of that kind. So Kitta have showed that this particular model is integrable. And the quasi-particles are not spin-1 magnons that you expect for an Ising magnet in 2D, but they are gapped localized Z2 vortices, which uh, he called pi fluxes, and some uh, emergent Majorana fermions, which are deconfined. They are freely dispersing and non-interacting. Uh, and what are these uh, vortices? Well, if you look at uh, any of these uh, operators, which are flux, flux operators around any loop. So let's take this elementary placket, which I've labeled by vertices one through six. Uh, what you do is you look at the bonds going out of all these uh, vertices and multiply the spin components associated with the bond direction. So for example, at site number one, the bond that is going out is an X type bond. So you put sigma one X here and just go through that. So, so these vertices uh, turn out to be uh, conserved uh, quantities, as I'll show in a minute. And uh, uh, just an aside, these are known to be uh, non-abelian anions, and they are interesting to many people from the point of view of topological quantum computing, and I'm not interested in any of that. Right? Okay, so, <clears throat> so um, like, let's, let's, uh, let's understand these excitations a little bit more. Uh, the Kitaev phase. So what I do is I uh, express, like uh, Kitaev did, uh, each of these spins in terms of a product of two Majorana or real fermions, uh, B and C, and I write them like that. And then I also need these representations to satisfy the spin commutation relations. So if, if I demand that, then a further condition needs to be imposed on the product of all these four Majoranas, and uh, this product should be one. In Okay, so in, in terms of uh, these fermions, the Hamiltonian becomes a four fermion Hamiltonian, where the products of the Bs is hidden in this A hat quantity. I've written it out here. A hat is just some Kitaev scale times this Uij, 
and these UIJs are just product of uh, two B fermions. It turns out that these UIJs are themselves uh, conserved quantities. They all commute with each other if they are on different bonds, and the square of them is uh, one. So they can take two values, plus one and minus one. So this allows me to divide my Hilbert space into sectors that are labeled by the eigenvalues of UIJ, and restricting to any such sector gives me a model of free uh, Majorana fermion. But there are way too many of these UIJs. There are two to the power of three n by two for an n site system, uh, possible combinations, and they don't all correspond to distinct physical states. And the physical objects are the gauge invariant fluxes, which uh, I defined in the first slide. Uh, but in terms of these uh, Majorana fermions, the Z2 fluxes take a very simple form. They are simply the products of these uh, <coughs> uh, factors uij around the loop. And these quantities remain invariant under uh, these, uh, this constraint. They commute with it. And now the Hamiltonian is non-interacting non in each flux sector once I uh, fix the fluxes. And these n Majorana fermions correspond to 2 to the power of n by 2 degrees of freedom in each sector. So it was shown by uh, Kitaev uh, uh, based on an earlier argument by Lieb for all bipartite lattices with some reflection symmetry that the ground state manifold corresponds to zero flux in all plaquettes, i.e. all the Ws are one in the ground state. So the non-zero expectation value of these plaquette Wilson loops and their finite excitation energy are in fact the smoking signature, smoking gun signatures of deconfined Majoranas. <clears throat> okay, uh, so what about real Kitai materials? So uh, two classes of materials have been uh, very widely studied. One is the alkali uh, iridates, uh, most notably sodium iridate and uh, alpha ruthenium trichloride, which was I think first reported by a paper which was authored with Shubro in it. And uh, these are the two most widely studied Kitai material candidates. And the first theoretical proposal uh, based on uh, this sodium iridate kind of system was made in 2009. And it's just a quantum analog of the kugel Komsky classical compass models. So in particular in sodium iridate, these, uh, uh, this is the structure. And if you look at from the top, you will find that the iridium atoms are surrounded by uh, octahedra of oxygen atoms. And they form a kind of uh, rumpled honeycomb lattice. <clears throat> and within the crystal field, the, uh, so, so the iridium atoms are in a D5 configuration. And uh, the crystal field, which is large, it splits the uh, D orbital and EG orbitals by a very large uh, splitting. And then I just need to worry about these T2G orbitals. So I look at these T2G orbitals, um, and these get split by strong spin orbit coupling because it's iridium. And these are the lower two ones, which are completely spilled, uh, filled, and it leaves just one uh, fermion in the, in the available uh, state. And these are like not just, uh, like uh, although they are j equals to half, they are not just spin. They are some complicated combination of spin and orbit, and they have, they have strong direction dependencies. Uh, the shape of the orbitals is, and with the result that one can show, uh, if you work with these orbitals, then the low energy Hamiltonian is approximately described by a Kitai model plus some competing subdominant interaction. Okay. Now the presence of competing spin-spin interactions, which are small, uh, if the distortions are not big and so on, uh, nevertheless drives both these materials into long range magnetic order. And it happens to be zigzag antiferromagnetic for both these systems. Now, uh, nevertheless, there is a very wide separation of the zigzag ordering scale, which is around 10 kelvins, and the Curie-wise temperature, which is uh, 100 kelvins. And this is an indication of the strong frustrating effect of the dominant uh, Kitaev interaction. Uh, the ground state uh, is therefore not Kitaev spin liquid, but magnetically ordered. However, these materials uh, are quite close in parameter space to the Kitaev spin liquid state. And I'll borrow a terminology from Shubro. Uh, they are in a so-called proximate uh, spin liquid phase. Um, so question is, is it possible to realize Kitaev physics in these materials? 
should I suppress magnetic order or should I look at excited states? Uh, both these views have uh, merit. Uh, first, uh, should I look at excited states? Uh, there can be two possible ways to uh, argue this out. One uh, view is that uh, the dominant interaction in the model is Kitaev like. So once you destroy the zigzag order by, say, raising the temperature, shouldn't the high energy excitations involved uh, be better described as Kitaev quasi particles? Because Kitaev interaction is now the only uh, big uh, interaction in, 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 in town. And so um, maybe the states are like Kitaev like. Uh, and maybe I should look for signatures of deconfinement in these high excited states, which are well above the zigzag ordering scale. A counter view, which has been uh, proposed by some people like Steve Binter and all that, is that these low energy exit. So uh, the point is that I have a um, Heisenberg, I, I have a um, uh, zigzag antiferromagnetic order. And the low energy excitations of a 3D magnet are typically spin 1 bosons, i.e. magnons, and not Majorana fermions. And so uh, I do have other stuff going on. And at higher energy, I also have magnon-magnon scattering, uh, which will all give a lifetime to the magnons and make them less well defined. But nevertheless, one should start from an interacting magnon picture. <clears throat> and of course, there is then no chance of uh, deconfinement type of physics. Yeah. Uh, the second strategy is to uh, not look at very high excited states, but go to low energy states, uh, but instead try to destroy the magnetic order using some other way of tuning, meaning a magnetic field, and then uh, suppress the spin density wave order using a magnetic field, which will possibly reinstate the deconfined phase. So can you have a field-tuned Kitaev quantum spin liquid in these real materials? So, so here's the original work, uh, which uh, reported the neutron scattering studies for alpha ruthenium trichloride system. So what I show here is uh, two different uh, uh, plots, one uh, showing the neutron scattering intensity with respect to the energy, and uh, here the scattering intensity with respect to the wave vector. And uh, th these oscillations indicate uh, essentially magnons. I don't want to go into details. But uh, if you look at the two sets of data, one of them is at 5 kelvins, which is below the zigzag ordering temperature. And the other set, C and D, is at 15 kelvins, which is above the zigzag ordering temperature. Same here. And what one sees is that as the temperature crosses and exceeds the zigzag ordering temperature, then the, which is around 8 kelvins in this system, then uh, all these uh, traces of magnon-like features uh, disappear and you are left with some more kind of smooth thing. And if you just look at even at low temperatures but at high energies, you can expect similar uh, incoherent features uh, above the zigzag energy scale. <clears throat> okay, so the other strategy is of course, as I said, to use a big magnetic field and kill the magnetic order. So here what uh, I'm showing is this well-known work by Matsuda's group where uh, this group uh, confirmed uh, a prediction made by Kitaev in his original work that because you have free Majorana fermions, uh, if you measure the thermal hall conductivity and you take it to the quantum limit, it should have exactly half the value expected for, uh, uh, for, for um, canonical fermions. And uh, this uh, study uh, measured the thermal hall conductivity um, as a function of uh, uh, like by, by ratcheting up the field. And at some point, which corresponded to the field required to destroy the zigzag order, uh, what was observed is that the thermal hall uh, conductivity was quantized in this half integer value predicted by Kitaev, indicating the presence of free Majorana fermions. But I must warn you that no other group, uh, to my understanding, has been able to confirm this half integer quantization so far, although every group I know of that has measured has reported non-zero thermal hall conductivity the system. Okay, we also, uh, around the same time, we're looking at a different measure, again using high magnetic fields, and what we did with the Cambridge group was uh, we um, took sodium iridate, the other system, and uh, measured the torque experienced by this system as a function of the magnetic field, and uh, we also could vary the direction of the magnetic field. 
which is indicated by these uh, uh, angles here. This just is the azimuthal angle. And um, fairly high fields were necessary to see some features in the torque magneto torque response. But what was interesting is that this had some non-monotonous features. And so uh, what we did was we uh, used the existing available uh, uh, effective spin Hamiltonians uh, in the literature and uh, checked which classes of them could, in principle, produce these features at these values of the magnetic fields, which are roughly corresponding to the scale of zigzag order here. And what we found is that uh, a large class of problems, although they are agreeable with uh, neutron scattering data and other thermodynamic measurements, they don't produce this non-monotonic torque response. And uh, those we checked out. And uh, it severely constrained the uh, parameters we could choose in our effective spin models for the remaining Hamiltonians. So using these effective uh, uh, spin models in a very restricted, uh, much restricted by these torque response studies, we tried to calculate the spin-spin uh, correlation functions as a uh, function of distance using exact diagonalization. It's not the thermodynamic limit we can go to. But what we did see was uh, some indication of a field-induced quantum spin liquid. What we found is that if you are at low temperatures, sorry, if you are at low fields, then uh, you have long-range magnetic order. And typically, the spin-spin correlation function decays very slowly with distance and shows this exact behavior. But if you are in a pure Kitaev state, then uh, the spin-spin correlation function basically drops abruptly to zero. And similar things happen once you apply uh, an actual uh, mag large magnetic field to these spin models we studied, that, uh, that uh, the spin-spin correlation function that decreased very slowly due to the presence of zigzag order now decreased rather fast in the presence of high magnetic field. OK, so now, so let me now state the base, basic question of today's talk. My question is, how good are Kitaev quasi-particles in the presence of perturbations such that the ground state has magnetic spin density wave order? So for, for this, I just want to play with a toy model and not bother about realistic uh, Hamiltonians, which are far too complicated. And uh, so I model, my model consists of just two terms. One is a Kitaev term. So it's chosen with this sign k greater than 0 and an antiferromagnetic Heisenberg term between nearest neighbor, neighbor spins uh, characterized by a positive j. So the phases of this model are uh, long known. They are studied by various, study, uh, various investigations. Uh, so for small values of the Heisenberg perturbation, uh, where j by k is below 0.12, you have essentially a Kitaev quantum spin liquid phase. Then once you exceed this value of Heisenberg perturbation, you enter a stripy antiferromagnetic phase, which persists until uh, 0 0.75. And beyond 0 0.75, you get the conventional nail antiferromagnet on the honeycomb lattice. Now, here in the stripy phase, there is a special point at j by k equals to half, where you can do a clever sublattice transformation, uh, which maps the model to a pure Heisenberg ferromagnet, which is also like a very nice reference point. And I would say for the purposes of this talk, this regime between 0.12, where the stripy AFM starts, to 0.5, where the, uh, where the zigzag order peaks, uh, is, sorry, where the stripy order peaks, is my so-called proximate spin liquid phase. OK, the, uh, how do I compare, how, how do I even approach the question of how good is a Kitaev state in a general, in the presence of general other many body interactions? Well, I'll use this uh, uh, analogy. Um, I, I'll try to uh, exploit some analogies with uh, an old work, uh, with uh, old work by Alt Schuller and others in 97, which was perhaps the first instance I really enjoyed about the application of many body localization. So what they did was they had a finite quantum dot, and they were interested in finding how good are Landau quasiparticles in this uh, system. So if I introduce a Landau quasiparticle, normally in, in the macroscopic system, uh, because of electron-electron interactions, it decays with a lifetime which is proportional to its, inversely proportional to its energy. 
Now, if, if you are in a finite size system, there is discreteness in the spectrum. And at some point, this argument doesn't work. And uh, one expects infinitely long-lived quasi-particles. So it, Al Shuler, et cetera, argued that this is a many-body localization transition. Now, um, uh, the quantity they tracked was the support size of the quasi-particles uh, in the presence of many-body interactions. So what you do is you take some quasi-particle, which is very well defined, and uh, you turn on some interaction in your system, which takes you away from this uh, known point. Then you can still continue to express your quasi-particle as a linear superposition of the exact many-body eigenstates. And you calculate the support size. If it's a good quasi-particle, you would not need too many of these many-body states to reconstruct your quasi-particle. If it's a, a hopeless state, then you will need practically all the many-body eigenstates to reconstruct your quasi-particles. And you will say that the quasi-particle is a bad excitation in this system. So, so essentially, it boils down to looking at the inverse participation ratio of quasi-particles. So what I do is the following. So I take the pure Kitai model, for ex example, and uh, I can calculate, let's say, all its eigenstates in a finite size system. I look at every state, any, any and every state, and express that state in the presence of uh, Heisenberg perturbation as a linear superposition of the many body states. So if the support size scales exponentially with the system size, then this is a bad quasi-particle, meaning Kitai quasi-particles are not good here. And in this language of many-body localization, this, this wave function is fully delocalized in the Fox space. It can also be delocalized in a fractal way, like if the support size scales exponentially, but with an exponent which is less than one, then, uh, then also the Kitai state would be good because Although the wave function is delocalized, it occupies a volume of measure zero uh, in the Fox space. Uh, but if it scales weaker than exponential, then this Kitaev state is just remarkably stable. It's an example of many body localization. <coughs> okay, so now to describe the delocalized states, we essentially need an exponentially large number of exact eigenstates. If all eigenstates are computed and no symmetries are exploited, then n equals to 16, remember this is a two-dimensional system, n equals to 16 is about the best we can do with existing computing resources. Uh, and we cannot really rely on Lancho's algorithms because they only give eigenstates near the extreme ends, or Davidson algorithms which are based on shift inverse strategies because they uh, essentially involve shifting and inverting, which is a very singular process if the shift is on the real axis. And they don't give typically more than few tens of states at a time. So we cannot get a macroscopic number of states by this method. <clears throat> okay, so our method is a new uh, exact diagonalization strategy, which uh, has been introduced a few years ago in the ab initio uh, community, but to my understanding, nobody has used it in, in, in our correlated systems community, so we might be the first one using it. So this is a contour integration based algorithm, and it gets you eigenstates in arbitrary user-specified eigenvalue ranges, and it allows parallelization at multiple levels. And unlike Lanchos and Davidson, Feast is also able to um, handle degeneracies of uh, eigenstates. So if so the basic idea has been uh, presented in this original paper in 2009 uh, that you use a contour integration based projector. So suppose H is your Hamiltonian and E is your complex energy, then if I just integrate it around some closed contour C, then uh, if the contour C encloses uh, some, uh, some eigenvalues in the range lambda 1 to lambda 2, Then what is claimed is that you will get a zero for all the poles which lie outside this range, and you'll get a one for poles which are inside this contour. So it's an exact projector to a space which is spanned by eigenfunctions only within this range. So of course you have to invert and shift, but the shift is usually complex, and uh, yeah, inversion is uh, cheaper than diagonalization. <coughs> So, um, and uh, what one uh, needs is, uh, for practical purposes, that uh, your Hamiltonian be sparse. 
okay, it's a two-dimensional system, not super sparse as opposed to Kelly trees and 1D systems, but still quite sparse. And uh, so this method projects large sparse Hamiltonians to subspace spanned by eigenfunctions whose uh, corresponding eigenvalues are enclosed by C. And I can now patch. If I want lots of eigenstates, I can just patch parallelly. And this contour integration I do by quadratures. I choose points in some clever way and just do quadratures and evaluate it. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, some initial uh, things which I want to show you. So I take some state, which is, let's say, the lowest, uh, lowest lying uh, two vortex state in, uh, 24, in, in systems of up to 24 spins. So what I do here is I look at the scaling of the uh, participation ratio or the support size. So n is my system size, and xi is my support size of the Kitaev state. And this is log in the base 2. So what I uh, um, have is uh, like a plot against 1 over n. So if, for example, I'm scaling like this, which is an unstable state, then uh, I will um, have this quantity uh, give me an intercept of around 1, basically 1, but within error bars. And if I'm kind of fractal, I occupy this range. But if I'm localized, then I go down, in fact, the slope is kind of there. So intercept tells me uh, what is this exponent for delocalized states. OK, so now quasi-particles are, uh, we found that quasi-particles are unstable only for j by k greater than 0.5. That is like, remember that 0.5 is the place where the uh, stripey order peaks. If I'm beyond this, then uh, my quasi-particles turn out to be unstable. OK, so now what do I do for other states? Well, uh, in order to compare from one sample size to another, I need to uh, take quantities which I can carry over from one size to another. And so energy density is, in fact, the quantity. We found that uh, uh, state specified by a given energy density roughly scale in the same way. Nearby states scale in the same way as you go to higher system sizes. So using that understanding, we plotted the support sizes as a function of energy densities. I have normalized it in some way so, so that the whole thing fits between minus 1 to 0. And uh, this is energy uh, per particle divided by the energy scale. So what we find is the following. If my Kitaev interaction is uh, uh, big enough, sorry, if my Heisenberg perturbation is big enough to take me just out of the Kitaev model but not very far away from it, then uh, to my surprise, what I find is that the support size of Kitaev states is, is much smaller than that of a stripe P, which means despite the presence of magnetic long range order, these wave functions are better described as uh, Kitaev rather than uh, Magnon or stuff like that. Uh, then I ratchet up my uh, Heisenberg perturbation a bit. Uh, I'm still in the stripe P phase, but now uh, at the lowest end, I still have states which are better described as Kitai, but as I go to higher energy density states, then both become equally good. But now if I have somewhat larger Kitai, sorry, larger Heisenberg perturbations, then only at the very low ends, and that too is a bit iffy, uh, I have Kitai states as better than uh, uh, Magnons, but most excited states uh, are better described as Magnons and so on. Uh, excitations of the stripey uh, magnet rather than Kitaev type of states. Uh, in fact, Kitaev tends to become quite poor rapidly here. So, so at higher energy densities, both Kitaev and Magnon excitations become bad. Uh, but, so, so, but the point is that junk does not simply uh, imply Kitaev by default, but junk could have multiple fathers. And uh, this is the, this is the uh, point to be made here. Uh, so, so at the lowest I get uh, energy densities, Kitaev is better than Magnon, practically everywhere. And so even though I have spin density wave order, Kitaev states are not bad at all for much of this uh, approximate spin liquid phase. But you have to go to low energy states. OK, so I can use these uh, findings in the previous slide to construct a phase diagram. So if I look at uh, the low energy states, then uh, they are more Kitaev states are more localized, meaning better defined. 
but then as I go to higher energy states, they quickly become uh, delocalized. But first they enter fractal. Fractal is still good because Kitai states will be long lived. It's only when they get delocalized that it becomes poor. Okay, so since we can calculate practically all the states, we can go and look at things which haven't been studied so far in the literature. And that is, for example, two more minutes. That is, for example, the uh, finite temperature physics. So we obtained this phase diagram using uh, specific heat calculations. Uh, and what we find is that, um, that there is, of course, this line uh, which is associated with uh, paramagnet to spin density wave order transition. But if you go to really low temperatures, what you find is another gap that is a uh, scale that is opening, which is continuing smoothly from the Kitai phase. That is the scale for the Wison gap, the gap to the flux ex excitations. It continues smoothly through the spin density wave order line. So this is where the spin density wave order transition takes place. And it goes down slowly, vanishing only at the point where the spin density wave order is peaking. The, the stripe order is peaking. So somehow this state carries the uh, nature of both the spin density wave order and the Kitai of spin liquid. And the wave functions show us that they're more Kitai like. Okay, so conclusions. We studied the stability of Kitai quasi particles in the presence of Heisenberg perturbations as a MBL phenomenon. We identified parameter regimes where Kitai states are localized, fractal, or delocalized. And delocalization means quasi-particle instability. And our finite temperature calculation show that a Wison gap and a non-zero value of these flux operators, which I didn't talk about, both characteristic of deconfinement, persist far into the proximate spin liquid phase. That has a concomitant spin density wave order. And Kitab quasi-particle excitations are stable for low energy states over a significant parameter range in the stripey phase. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vikram. Questions? A basic question. Um, we know that in you are in two dimensions. We know there is no deconfinement at finite temperature. So how can it be that? I mean, and numerically, you obviously, in small systems, yeah. you use your. So I don't know. Yeah. So the thing is, I'm just tracking this uh, characteristic energy yeah. scale that sure, is the sure, Wyson. Sure. But, but That's the only meaning of deconfinement. Sure, sure. But otherwise, strictly speaking, t equals to zero. Yeah. Right. Well, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Even This is done at the um, uh, phase where the pure Kitai model is completely gapless spin liquid, right? The pure Kitai model is a gapless. Uh, yeah. So if you would have done this at the phase transition between a gapless and the gapped this thing, would you expect anything different, or it's basically the same? Uh, gapless and the gapped in this model? Yeah, because you could have. So you could have varied your pattern. I mean, you started from a isotropic Kitai. Yeah. But in principle, you know that. Oh, you mean to say the toric code limit? Well, toric code like is that. the other extreme limit, but in between there is a transition, right? Okay. A gap to a gap. And uh, uh, well, um, I, I think so, but I don't know uh, for sure, but I think it should be, yeah. In the fi finite temperature phase diagram, so there is omega p expectation value for higher j. It was peaking at some point. Uh, so go to the finite temperature. This omega p expectation. This one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm yet to understand. These dots are extracted from specific heat uh, values, uh, which are these points essentially peaks in the specific heat. And usually, like in some cases, we notice that the uh, expectation value of the flux continues to rise a little bit, but then it crashes inevitably at higher temperature. Once you start exciting Wyson's of both signs uh, with almost equal probability, then this crashes to zero. But yeah, I don't understand. I would love to understand why this uh, peak appears times. Um, so I just wanted to ask if uh, you just considered a nearest neighbor Heisenberg model. Right? So in a real compound, of course, there are much more complex yeah. interactions. So do you expect uh, some of your conclusions to still hold good, or in that's, which that's, direction it would go? That's the belief. That uh, you know, all these uh, small uh, perturbations only fool you because they give you some superficial magnetic order 
um, leading you to believe that it's kind of a direct product kind of state, but actually it's uh, it's uh, still uh, Majoranas and Bisons, which are quite good. Because if you if you have taken the J, I think 0 0.3 or something already, you can see that the Kitaev quasi particle is less stabilized. Yes, that's uh, but instead of that, if you have a further neighbor interactions kind of, and you if you can have instead of two body, three body, or other terms. Can they also suppress it? Yes, they will in principle suppress the Kitaev quasi particle, but to the, the extent to which they will suppress is of course a model to model yes, story. Of course. But uh, my guess is that this is contrib uh, controlled by the scale of the Kitaev interaction with respect to the rest. And so again, in that case, there will be a considerable region in the zigzag ordered phase where, where you will, you will see Kitaev quasi particles only in the low energy sector. Because in a detailed calculation, people find it is actually a very tiny phase space. Uh, but they are not ever comparing wave functions. That is that's what also I know. true. They are always calculating true. some quantity they love to calculate, yeah, like neutron scattering or something. So maybe uh, just a simple question. So uh, the message is that uh, in the in the PSL phase at the high energy, the high energy state still has some Kitaev natures. You, 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 yes, you analyze this from the... finite the, energy density yeah. states are also, there, there's a considerable number of states which have Kitaev. Right, right, right. You analyze this through your... As you go above, it becomes hopeless. It's right, right, right. Kitaev, but it's not Magnons either. Sure, sure. The question, my, my confusion is that where this, um, why do you need to borrow the, the language of MPL? Where the disorder comes? I mean, you could well, just... There's no need to have disorder for this kind of way of looking at MBL. It is kind of, a, a, so, suppose you have some basis which approximately block diagonalizes your Hamiltonian, uh, and uh, suppose you uh, ratchet up some parameter, and in many cases what happens is that for some critical value of the parameter, once you cross it, the wave functions become completely qualitatively different on the other side, so to reconstruct any of these new wave functions, you need practically all the eigenstates in the old sector. And this is an MBL transition where a, a macroscopic number of states on one side is needed to reconstruct even a single state on the other. And this is true even for the uh, single particle Anderson problem or even the disorder induced Anderson MBL transition. Because there, the, if the disorder is very strong, the real space basis approximately block diagonalizes the but once the states become extended, to describe any of these states, you need practically all the states on the other side. So, so I think one should get out of this disorder thing to, to just uh, specify MBL, but that's a personal opinion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mikram, sorry. So I think it's related to what Tarun and even Meng asked. So, uh, so as I understand, so if you calculate this support, or let's say the quasi-particle residue, right? that finite energy density should be zero, I mean, if you go to very large system. Is that what, because if you see the system size scaling, like there should not be at finite energy density any finite uh, quasi-particle residue, right? So, so, uh, uh, so, many, so many states uh, do have finite energy density. So it's, it's uh, like low-lying states, of course, they, they have extremely small energies uh, in the, th so you can take the thermodynamic limit. If you just look at the lowest Vison, that doesn't scale, its energy doesn't scale with the system size, it's, it, the density is zero. But you can look at very high excited states, which have finite energy density. And there also we see often uh, the nature is type like Low support, no, 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 those are like, uh, you can see that quickly it doesn't survive, right? So, so the low support thing goes away very rapidly uh, as you uh, go to higher energy densities. So you see that this is energy density and this is the ground state. So you go to only 15% from below and uh, you, it's, it's practically impossible to find localized states. Uh, so. Maybe we can have this discussion. Yeah, uh, maybe I didn't get the question. Yeah, we are yeah. over time. Uh, so more questions, ask him during the tea break. Uh, let's thank Vikram.